Welcome to the Challenging the Necessity of Animal Experimentation Approaching the Turning Point session at the Animal Law Conference. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Stacey Gordon Sterling and I'm the Animal Law Program Director at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. Before we begin, I would like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Aisha Akhtar is a double board certified neurologist and preventive medicine specialist with a background in public health. She is the CEO of the Center for Contemporary Sciences, which is pioneering the transition to replace the use of animals in experimentation with effective human-based technologies. Elizabeth Baker is the Regulatory Policy Director for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, a nonprofit working for more effective, efficient, and ethical medical research, product testing, and training. Elizabeth leads the Physicians Committee's work to modernize policies to support the use of scientifically valid non-animal and human biology-based testing for regulatory purposes. Sue Leary has built a career focused on coordination of programs and services, education and advocacy, administration and planning, and membership development in nonprofit organizations. Since 1995, she has served as president of American Anti-Vivisection Society and the Alternative Research and Development Foundation, which funds and promotes the development of non-animal alternative methods for use in biomedical research, product testing, and educational demonstrations. Thank you to all of our speakers for joining us today. Now we will begin our discussion. So to all of you, thank you for joining us. How are animals used in experimentation? What types of animals are used and what types of companies and institutions carry out these experiments? Sue, let's start with you. Okay. Hi, everybody. And, and thanks, Stacy. Uh, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I'm uh, very happy to do this and honored to be on a panel with these uh, very accomplished women. And I'm looking forward to the discussion and hearing what they have to say, too. Uh, but to answer your question, I, I always say that I think it's useful to organize our thoughts around this in terms of animals used for biomedical research, uh, animals used for chemical testing, and animals used in education and training. So really in those three ways, that's, uh, that's one way to sort of think about the different ways animals are used in science. And all three really um, have been active for a very long time. Uh, our organization, American Anti-Vivisection Society, was founded in 1883 around this issue. So uh, at that time, uh, our founder, Carolyn Earl White, had started uh, an animal shelter in Philadelphia, and doctors from the University of Pennsylvania came to the shelter and wanted to use dogs. Uh, and uh, she said, no. And uh, we never did, uh, she never did have to surrender any dogs to them. But uh, the interest was very intense at that time. And, um, and it continued for, you know, to this day. So it's, it's uh, all kinds of animals. Uh, at that time, it was, it was a lot of dogs. But uh, the animal predominantly used these days, uh, uh, mice are, are used. They're genetically engineered. And that has contributed to a very large increase in numbers of animals being used in biomedical research, especially. So um, the, the thing is that mice aren't counted uh, in the US. So we don't really know how many are used, but that's a question that I know people often have. Uh, but the most recent estimate uh, is probably around 100 million animals used every year in the US, which includes fish, uh, frogs, mice, rats, guinea pigs, dogs, and non-human primates. And until recently, uh, about 2015, 2011, uh, there was a report from the National Academy of Sciences about the necessity for using chimpanzees in research and, uh, and behavioral and biomedical research. So really, as recently as that, chimpanzees were being used, but we're happy to say that's no longer the case thanks to the efforts of uh, a lot of organizations. So a lot of different animals, the pain levels are pretty intense for a lot of them. Uh, estimates uh, based on 
the uh, statistics that are collected on those animals that are covered by the Animal Welfare Act are that 40% of the animals will experience pain. So it's a, it's a lot of different institutions, companies that use them, and uh, for all different purposes. Um, yeah, so I can just jump on to what Sue said. So you can break it down to there are chemical companies, there are pharmaceutical companies, there are household product companies. Those are um, the private companies that tend to use um, animals in, in testing. Then there is academic centers. So almost every, I mean, I, I can't think of any major university in the country that does not have, um, uh, does not conduct animal experimentation. If they have a science program, a biomedical science program, they're likely doing, um, conducting animal experimentation. There are governmental agencies like the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, the Food and Drug Administration, um, our military, Department of Defense, BARDA, um, there's the Homeland, Department of Homeland Security, the CDC. They are either directly funding and or conducting animal experimentation as well. So the, there's, there's a lot of different players involved in this, from the private to the, to the very public. And what's important to know is when we're talking about the public uses of animal experimentation and funding, we're really talking about our tax dollar use here in this, in this area. So the NIH is probably the largest governmental funder of medical research, and that includes um, animal testing. And so they are using our tax dollars to support animal experimentation. Same with the FDA, same with the CDC, and same with others. Now, if we were to break down how animals are used in the US, and Sue is right, we don't really have the numbers of how many animals truly are used in the United States because more than 95% of the animals used in experimentation in the United States are not counted because they are not included in the Animal Welfare Act. So they're not even defined as animals under the Animal Welfare Act. But if we were to, so we don't know exactly how, the breakdown of how animals are used in the United States, but we can make extrapolations based on the breakdown in the UK. And so in 2018, the UK numbers were from their own um, department, um, their agency, I forgot what it's exactly called, but their governmental agency that tracks the use of animals. Um, it was um, only about 26% of the animals used were used to satisfy regulatory or legal requirements. So when most people think of animal testing, they mostly think that animals are used for drug development. That's not really where most of the animals are used in experimentation. That's only about 26%, and that also includes chemical toxicity testing. So only about that small percentage, 26% of animals used in experimentation are used because they have to by law or by regulatory protocol. They have to. The far majority of animals used in experimentation are not used because they have to. They are used for basic research and for disease-oriented research, which there, for which there is no legal or regulatory requirement to use animals. So people use animals in those areas because they can and because they choose to use animals, not because they have to for regulatory or legal purposes. The stuff that, that Sue and Aisha have shared, you know, it's depressing stuff. It's really depressing stuff, in my opinion, to be talking about animals used in science. But even so, I still find it a really exciting time to be working in the field. And I would still encourage others to, um, to try to enter it because around the world, we are seeing regulators, we're seeing industry, non-governmental organizations all unifying around this urgent need to integrate methods that are, um, that are more predictive for humans and that reduce animal studies. Aisha mentioned drug development. That is where my work has focused over the past um, over the past handful of years. Although I have worked in, um, I've worked a bit on ending animal tests for other industries that are regulated by the federal government and state government as well. Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit about drug development. So how are they used? Um, how many? And then and then um, where do we go from there? In drug development and in other regulatory testing as well, the animals are used because we're trying to get information on what's going to happen when that investigational medicine or whatever the product is, is given to humans. 
So we want to know, is it going to be safe? Is it going to be harmful? Is it going to work? Um, but there are major issues with the ability of animal studies to inform what happens in humans. Um, it is true that for, for drug development, it's a smaller percentage, but we're still talking about likely millions of animals. Uh, for every new drug that comes to market, animals were extensively tested. We are talking about most often dogs, mice, rats, non-human primates, but all of the other animals that Sue mentioned are used in drug development and regulatory testing as well. Um, I think it's a real problem that we don't know how many animals are being used because without numbers, I don't know how in the world we're, we can possibly measure reduction and replacement. And in this field, you'll hear a lot about the three R's and the three R's are essentially an ethical construct that have been incorporated into agency and industry goals, into different mandates, into legislation around the world. It stands for refinement, reduction, and replacement. Refinement being um, adjustments made to studies, to try to, uh, to studies, to housing, et cetera, to try to make things a little bit better for the animals that are being used. Reduction, meaning reducing the number of animals used. This could be using smaller study sizes. It could be merging tests, doing multiple different tests on the same animals. And then there's replacement, which is what I think all of us here on this panel are, are really working for, which is using approaches that don't use animals at all. And I think it's really important that our movement works to establish the numbers, because if we can't be precise about them, I don't know how we can measure whether or not we're really achieving these three R goals that are being held up by our federal agencies and by our Congress and by, even by um, the regulated industries. I will add, I will add to what um, Elizabeth said about the optimism because yeah, it is depressing to think about the number of animals used and how little transparency in, in this, um, in the United States especially. But there is a great deal of optimism and we'll talk about that I'm sure a little bit more as we talk about how things are, uh, momentum is building that in, in actually focusing more on that last of the three R's that Elizabeth mentioned, which is on replacement. So there is a momentum building on replacing animal use, not necessarily or not wholly out of concern for animal ethics, but also because there is a human health imperative behind that. Um, as Elizabeth mentioned, um, we're, we're starting to see that animal testing greatly has its limits and is largely not very reliable in predicting what we're going to see in humans, especially in regards to drug safety and effectiveness. So there's been a growing momentum to really change how we do research, even at the basic level to some degrees, but especially in the chemical and the pharmaceutical world, to move more and more into newer technologies that are based on human biology that will have the potential to replace animal testing, not just reduce or refine, but replace animal testing. That will not only be better for the animals, of course, but also be better for humans. So it's a, very much a win-win scenario that we're working on. So that's a perfect lead into my next question, uh, which is what are some alternatives to animal experimentation and what are the benefits of the new technologies? Uh, Sue, let's start with you again. Sure. Uh, yeah, I agree. This is the exciting part and uh, where we've, I think all three of us have chosen to, to work in this area. Um, there are, if you think of alternatives as uh, new models, basically the questions, the scientific questions that are being asked are good questions. We don't have a problem with that. It's a good question to say, how can we come up with an effective treatment for uh, a disease. It's a good question to say, is this chemical okay to use? Um, so the questions are great. Uh, it's how do you get the answers? So in order to get answers, what has always been the practice in science is to try to think of a model uh, so that you can try it out in something. It just so happens that the animal models were sort of the only technology available uh, for many, many years. And now with uh, the rise in technology 
there's so many new and exciting ways to do this. And uh, we also know a lot more about biology, so we can model systems, we can create model systems in a, in a new way that are, uh, that's pretty exciting. So if you think of a model as um, to answer a scientific question, uh, a model will recapitulate a biological system, a piece of a biological system that might have the, the information, a very precise bit of information that you're looking for. So you don't need a whole animal to try and figure out what will happen in human liver cells when uh, someone is exposed to a chemical. You need human liver cells and you need them to be in a system that is a pretty good model. Uh, so those cells have to stay alive for a period of time so that you can test them. Uh, they have to be similar to uh, human cells, or they have to be human cells, and they have to be similar to what uh, the, the structure would be. So alternatives are a lot of things. They, they might be um, a, a biological system, but they can also be um, what people are calling in silico methods. So computers can also simulate biological systems. And we're seeing a lot of computer simulation that can happen so fast and so inexpensively that that's a very appealing new area. Plus you can run multiple simulations, compare them with each other and learn from that. So when I think of alternatives, I think of alternatives as a, you know, it could be a thing. It could be like an alternative method, uh, which is what we're involved with. We support the development of alternative methods. We pay researchers to look for them. But it's also an approach. Um, what question are you asking? Because if your question is, I want to know what happens when I put this in a mouse, <laughs> then there is no other way to answer that question. So part, part of what's happening is researchers are learning to ask questions in a new way. Is that really what you want to know? Is it really the question you need the answer to, or do you need to know what's happening in a human liver? So it's, it's a thing, but it's also an approach. And, and I just want to say, we, we often forget about the education stuff. Um, there's some great and really cool uh, alternatives in the education space. There's alternative virtual reality systems and augmented reality systems. and the educators are having a lot of fun with the alternatives now, and so are the students. Elizabeth. It's been known, as Sue said, it's been known for a long time that animal tests really are not great predictors of human outcomes. At one time, it was what we had, but there has been a lot of innovation, a lot of dedication from scientists that have developed new approaches that are not using other animals. Instead, they're using human cells and tissues, they're using computer simulations with the intention of being more predictive for humans. Um, the models are human focused. You'll hear, you might hear the word human biology based, human based, human relevant. This really is all, um, it's all this really the same thing, which is aiming to mimic the human organ function and, um, and to understand human outcomes, human systems, if we're talking about regulatory testing. And in product testing, there have been a lot of advances um, on the in vitro side in particular so far. For drug testing, I would say that organ chips or tissue chips, microphysiological systems, um, it's all referring to the same thing. Um, they've been in the spotlight the most. And so I imagine that, that many of you may have heard of them. What they are is engineered devices that contain hollow channels lined by living human cells and they reconstitute organ level function. They're mimicking the structure and the function of human organs. They're using human biology and it could be as easy as a skin scrape where the skin cells are reprogrammed they're developed into any human organ, and then those are used to test products. Um, these came from academia, but all industry is heavily invested. You see small and large companies uh, very involved in their development. The Food and Drug Administration has been involved 
for a number of years, as have, um, as have the National Institutes of Health. They've run a huge collaboration. As a result, there are many organ chips that are commercialized now, they're ready for use, and they're being used. Uh, unfortunately, they're not really being used to replace the animal studies yet. They're being used for internal decision making at companies. Um, and we can, I think we'll get into the reason why a little bit later, which I believe is policy. But I'll leave that for later in the discussion. For now, I want to leave it at there are a lot of in vitro methods that are available for use right now. There are also computer models, as, as Sue mentioned. I am, I think I'm most excited about AI. And um, I really think that this has the opportunity to just transform the way that we test products because all of us understand the importance of product testing. What we want to do is make sure that it's done with modern science that is as predictive as possible for humans so we can protect humans and we can move away from using animals. Um, last week, I attended the uh, conference. It's called the World Congress on Alternatives and Animal Use in the Life Sciences. And one of the keynotes I found to be just absolutely fascinating, it was on a virtual digital patient. So using different data sources, patient-specific information, information on your cohort, family history, info from wearable devices, they create an actual simulated virtual patient. The virtual patient is then used in lieu of some animal studies and human studies. Um, when it comes to product development, it's not just animals that are tested on. Humans are tested on too in clinical trials. And for this reason, I, I really wanna stress that it's about finding the best models for for the purpose that you're seeking, which on the regulatory side, sometimes I think I'm a little luckier because on the regulatory side, we are trying to protect humans. And so using human biology, moving away from using the biology of other animals is, is the way to go. And so all that to say, there are a lot here now and there are even more coming. I, I don't think that we have seen the tip of the iceberg yet, um, or, or we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg uh, because there has been so little, when, when you really look at it, there's been so little funding to these methods. It's just absolutely incredible what scientists have been able to do when kind of all odds are against them. I can add, you know, when you think about like where we can see healthcare in the next, you know, let's say in 20 years from now, and what, what I think the vision is and where we're heading and where we need to be heading is understanding that there are even biological variations among people, right? We know this. And this is why we have to have many different types of people enroll in clinical trials. We cannot just have Caucasian okay. men enroll in clinical trials because that, you know, that does not tell us whether a drug is going to be safe and effective in a woman of my age and my background or, you know, your age and your background or, um, you know, my mom or, um, you, know, um, it's, it's, you know, my husband, for example, and so on. There is a lot of variation even amongst the human population. So then that also get, begs the question, you know, why are we adding even more variation by adding totally different species in the mix when we think about research? But so where we're heading is into an era called personalized medicine, and that's going to be the future of medicine, meaning that one day a drug will be tailored to fit your biology and to fit my biology and to fit Elizabeth's biology and to fit my husband's biology or, you know, a group of individuals who have a uh, similarly in their biology, right? So what that means is that we really need tests that are based on human cells and tissues. And one of the wonderful things about human organs on a chip or 3D printing of miniature human organs is that we can actually create variation that captures the diversity in the human population. So we can use cells from you, Stacy, to create a lung on a chip and a kidney on a chip, and a mini brain on a chip, and a gut on a chip, and actually create the whole Stacy, a mini Stacy on a chip. We can create a mini me 
mini me <laughs> on a chip and so on. And you can think about that. And these can actually be used not only to help see if a drug is going to work against, in my biology, against maybe the diseases I have against my cancer cells, if I have them, for example, but we can also one day conduct clinical trials in the lab. So we can conduct clinical trials using these types of technologies before we actually get to the point where we conduct trials in living human patients. And so when we think about this, this is where we're going. This is where medicine is going. There's, there's basically, what that means is that there's going to be less of room for animal testing in that space because we need to really move forward with capturing human diversity in testing methods and using human cells, human tissues, human organs, and so on. And so this is why this is so exciting with these human organs on a chip, these miniature human organs being 3D printed, the virtual humans that are being created as Elizabeth talked about. This is all moving in that direction of personalized medicine. And as we move more and more in that direction, again, who knows what the next big breakthrough in medical research technology is going to be, but that's where we're heading. And that's why I think so many of us, all three of us, Sue, Elizabeth, and I are so optimistic right now because we know, as many do, many other academics and scientists know, as we move more and more in that direction, there is far less of a role of animal testing in that entire paradigm. I think all of us on the panel are so grateful for this incredible innovation that's been happening over the past 15 years because this has given us hope for change in a way that we haven't had in a long time. So then what are some of the challenges um, and successes of bringing these new technologies in into practice? Uh, Elizabeth, let's start with you this time. Okay. When it comes to the challenges, there are so many. <laughs> there is so much inertia at companies, at agencies that just keep the wheels of animal experimentation going. You have you're, the largely the established professionals were trained using animals. You have a huge interest from early career researchers who are getting into non-animal um, work more and more, but they probably don't have the confidence yet to be quite as outspoken as some of the uh, more established researchers who have spent an entire career um, working on animals. You have a lack of training and you have a lack of funding, um, but you also have laws and policies that make it hard, sometimes impossible, for companies to really use these approaches. I do not see the science as the challenge. I have a lot of um, respect for scientists, what they can do. And I truly believe that as we, as we give more resources and support scientists who are trying to do things in a new way, we are going to see major advances happen very quickly. Um, the animal studies are a huge part of the product failures. And that goes all the way back to basic research and into the regulatory testing as well. The results are just not very useful for humans. And so this should be a catalyst for improving the situation. I really believe that our US policy should support the use of new approaches that don't use animals. At minimum, we, d we need to ensure that our laws and policies are not limiting their use. And unfortunately, they, currently law and policy limits the use of non-animal methods. I'm gonna stick with drug development because that's what I've been working on. When you look at FDA's regulations, it's a challenge. As I imagine many of you know, regulations are the rules that an agency uh, put forth in order to carry out legislative mandates. And in drug development, they are, a way that, that drug sponsors learn about what they need to do in drug development in order to get a product to market. And many of them on their face require animal data. So the word animal or in vivo will be in the regulation itself. So we have proposed that these regulations be modified by switching out the word animal for non-clinical. And that would clearly allow for the use of non-animal, these in vitro computational approaches that we all just discussed to be used. 
we're starting to see some success. Um, we've been working on this regulatory issue for a number of years, and I was starting to wonder <laughs> if it was going to change. But I will say, now I am very optimistic. Congress became involved in this issue, and they actually directed the FDA to review and modify FDA regulations to clearly reflect that the FDA will accept valid non-clinical approaches, and that includes from non-animal approaches. The FDA has until September 30th of this year to report back with progress. I'm really hoping that that report is made public and we can see what the agency has done um, because that regulatory issue, we hear from companies frequently that they want to use modern approaches. They don't want to use the animal test. Sometimes they're doing them to check the box for the agency and they don't want to do it. But if the regulation says they have to do it or some other policy indicates that they have to do it, well, then the company has to do it if they want to get their product approved. For FDA, they also use guidance documents to communicate their expectations with drug sponsors. These guidance documents, they're not technically binding, but they can have that effect because they are expressing the agency's recommendations for what a company should do if they want to get their product approved. Now, guidance documents, they are, um, I'd say they're a lot more fluid than the regulations, and they're updated much more frequently than FDA's regulations ever are. So I think that a lot of our efforts need to focus on guidance. Um, increasingly, we are seeing language included in guidance documents that is intending to provide flexibility. Um, there is a guidance that governs this non-clinical phase of testing, which is where the animal tests are done. Um, and it recommends using at least two species. There are many guidance that will enumerate animal tests, but at the same time, they will include some language that says you can use an alternative method, essentially if it's appropriate. Um, but unfortunately, the guidance also includes some language at the top saying that you can use the alternative method if it satisfies regulations and statutes. And we know what the regulations say. So until those regulations change or this language is removed from guidance, that intended flexibility is just not usable, unfortunately, by industry. There are other ways to, uh, to work around some of this rigid, um, some of these rigid frameworks. And one of them is something we had been working for this for years to get FDA to establish a pathway uh, so that companies could work with the agency to show the usefulness of the non-animal approach and to get the FDA stamp of approval, that, which is called regulatory acceptance, um, that companies can indeed use that method and the agency will accept it. There is such a need for, uh, for leadership at the regulatory agencies when it comes to uh, when it comes to non-animal approaches. And I, I guess just before I, before I hand it over, I think it's really important um, to say that when policy changes, we see the science change. And um, FDA in 2015 put out a guidance document. It was very exciting. I haven't seen any before or after that uh, that were similar, but they actually recommended against using a, in rabbits for a certain type of testing, and instead they recommend using ex vivo or in vitro methods instead. Well, that was great, Elizabeth. That is, uh, that's what I see too in thinking of those three areas, you know, the biomedical research, the testing, and the education. There's there's a lot of factors. Uh, for example, one of the easiest uh, replacements should be in education and training, because you're not even exploring a scientific question. You're just demonstrating anatomy or a physiological response or something like that. You can easily uh, recapitulate that in some kind of a model or a mannequin or something, and uh, and a lot of of those are available. But there, 
it's not a regulatory uh, barrier. It's really um, a culture barrier because the, the culture of education, if you think of the frog dissection all over the country, uh, schools are very much locally controlled. Um, uh, there's a culture of, you know, don't tell me what to do. And uh, so the, there are a lot of factors like that that come into play. What was interesting this year with COVID, because uh, kids weren't in anatomy labs, they weren't in wet labs at their schools, they were learning from home. So I know our uh, Animal Learn division was able to help a lot of students and teachers use some of the electronic resources and simulations for, uh, for school dissection, and they worked really well. So I think a lot of uh, educators and students got exposed to those this year. So hopefully there will be an uptick in acceptance for that. I want to say in terms of the challenge of money, since we do funding, and we've been doing funding since 1993. And so I interact with a lot of researchers who are at academic institutions. Definitely, it provides focus. I mean, money doesn't solve problems. It doesn't, you know, you don't just hand somebody money and the problem is solved, or otherwise Alzheimer's would have been solved a long time ago because people, the governments all over the world have thrown money at Alzheimer's and they were using these really uh, in help, unhelpful mouse models for years. So hopefully there will be some progress soon. But um, throwing money at something doesn't fix it. But uh, an intelligent, you know, well-structured funding stream that's significant uh, from the federal government would provide focus. And, uh, and I think it would I think it really would be helpful. And we have seen successes when there has been a focus on solving a particular scientific problem. And I just don't, I, I don't want to forget the big thing, which we heard about a lot in the World Congress too, was the problem of uh, how do we know these alternative methods work? This is what we hear, right? Um, all three of us, I'm sure. So, and that is this process called validation. And the validation is typically looking at the results you got from the alternative test, comparing them to the results you got from the animal test, and saying, but wait a minute, they don't line up perfectly. And so one of the really exciting things happening now, I think, is that there's going to be a National Academy of Sciences group that is going to really focus on this issue of what are these animal test results and what are they telling us? And I think that finally there will be enshrined in a National Academy of Sciences report um, the uh, problems with animal testing. And maybe we'll move away from comparing the alternatives or validating the alternatives against animal tests and start validating them against uh, some of the human data that we have. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. And I think that there are some people in the federal government who are really uh, a force behind this. And uh, I, I think that there's going to be good things coming out of that. Aisha, can you share your perspectives on this question? Yeah, um, I actually think that we can frame everything in terms of money <laughs> when we're talking about policy education, even cultural barriers, and scientific innovation. Ultimately, I think all of it comes just down to some degree to money. So if we think about policy changes, I think pharmaceutical companies right now, they have an incredibly high failure rate in drug development and vaccine development. About 90 to 95% of drugs and vaccines that have passed the preclinical, and preclinical means before human testing, and much of that involves animal testing. So about 90 to 95% of the drugs and vaccines that have passed testing in animals end up failing when tried in humans. And most of them fail because they didn't work in humans or there are safety problems that arise that were not noted in the other tests, including the animal tests. So from a pharmaceutical perspective, there's a real cost-effectiveness 
need for them or a real cost, you know, it's, it's a costly process when you think about this, right? And it usually takes them about one to $6 billion to get any drug to the market. Um, and these are the few that do succeed. So from their perspective, they wanna cut costs. They wanna get their products out as cheaply, as fastly, as um, effectively as possible. Animal testing is not really fitting that bill because they're laborious to do animal tests. They're costly. You think about all the things that, entail, that are entailed in animal testing. Not only are you having to house animals in laboratories, you have to provide veterinary care, you have to provide, you know, the ca you have to buy the caging, you have to buy the food, you have to buy all the machinery that's used to use these animals in these testing methods. So there's cost to that in addition to the high cost that comes with a high failure rate. So from their perspective, they would like to reduce those costs. And so one way to reduce it is to use more predictive testing methods. And so there is great reason to believe that these more human biology-based testing methods will be more predictive. There have been some side-by-side -side comparisons to some degree that have shown that they can and have been more predictive. But you know, there, there's room for more of that type of analysis as well. But we know that what we're doing now is not working. So we need to shift. So from that perspective, there's a cost-effectiveness approach to using human relevant testings instead of animal testing. But they won't go there and use it unless regulatory agencies like FDA allow drug companies and vaccine producers to use these non-animal, more human relevant testing methods. So that's where the policy part comes to play. And so we've been actually been working on um, promoting a legislation that will open the doors um, that will basically, so, so basically everything that Elizabeth said about FDA is, is true. And it's great to see that change happening within FDA, but it's not happening fast enough. And, the, and I worked at the Food and Drug Administration for 10 years, and I can tell you it is a bureaucracy like every other governmental agency. And it, is, it has not caught up to where the science is. And so the change within FDA is not happening fast enough. So there's a new policy to try to kind of push FDA in, 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 in essence in a little bit, give them that nudge. And that would allow for more types of testing methods to be used in drug development and in vaccine development. Now, on the other side, when we talk about academic research, yeah, there's a cultural barrier. Many academics, they've been trained on using animals, and so that's what they know, and so that's what they do, that's what they built their careers on, that's what their publications are on, and so on. But they also need to continue to bring in funding for their work. And as long as NIH, for example, prioritizes funding of animal testing, that's where the research is gonna go in academic centers. So another policy direction, in, in, in a sense, that can happen and should happen is putting a nudge basically behind NIH and other governmental funding agencies to make a shift now that we need to start putting more funding, our governmental funding, into these newer testing methods, human relevant testing methods. Once they do that, academics will have greater opportunities. They will see that's where the funding revenue is coming from. That's where the funding is going. And so that will provide an incentive for them to start embracing and using these other testing methods. I've heard at CCS, we've heard from a lot of academics who are creating academic centers that are creating Oregon on a chip technology, for example. And when they apply for NIH funding for their, their research, they get kicked back too often. What they're being told is, why aren't you doing animal testing? instead. So there's, you know, the, that needs to change within the funding agencies. They need to start prioritizing more predictive, more effective testing methods based on human biology and less funding towards animal testing. Ultimately, no funding towards animal testing, but we'll take a kind of a, a gradual approach or a practical approach here. And then with private companies and when we think about even um, the market, the market Market analysis is showing that although animal testing has a, there's a greater investment in animal testing methods as opposed to organ on a chip technology or the virtual human technology in general. But what market analysis is showing is that the trend is changing though. 
the projection in the next 10 years, next five years, next 10 years, next 15 years is showing a much, a actually a growth in the, um, um, the market for these other types of testing methods that are based on human biology and actually showing a plateau and then a decline in the market for animal model, for animal testing. So that's good news. And so there's a lot of role that investors and the private marketing world can play in accelerating that, that market expansion of human relevant testing methods that can replace animal testing. So I think, you know, there, there's just a lot of room for hope. There's a lot of efforts going on. It's going to take, you know, funding. It's going to, you know, funding changes. It's going to take money. It's going to take policy changes. It's going to take education. But I'm, I'm really just excited to be part of a panel where, you know, I'm working with folks who are all working in these areas and um, the scientific community is increasingly getting behind this idea, the notion that we need to replace animal testing more and more because it is the, what's, what's needed for human health. And that ultimately is what's going to drive this change more than anything else. You've all given us a lot of great information and shared some really interesting points. And I truthfully would love to just sit and listen to you all talk about these issues um, and have a conversation. But we are actually getting close on time. So my last question that I, I want to pose to the three of you is, what can our viewers do to better the lives of animals used in experimentation? And Aisha, this time we will start with you. Okay, well, so policy, obviously, you know, if you are, we, we need more, we need more policy experts in this, in this area. There are very few. Um, it's limited. And so, you know, if you're a law student or um, you're thinking of where you want to focus your career on, we need more and more policy experts on animal testing issues. We, that world is changing and we're, there's going to be a real need for more policy experts in that area. One thing everyone can do is, you know, when you see an article, and this is what I tell so many people, when you see an article on animal testing, New York Times, for example, they had a huge piece a few several months ago, which was the, one of the most biased pieces I've ever seen, basically almost like a front piece for um, non-human primate researchers, were, which were calling for a need for creating a monkey stockpile, and that's what they were calling it. So they were trying to argue for the need for more funding and investment in shipping and breeding monkeys in the US for use for biomedical research. And so when you see articles like this, often what you see is that there's a, a place for public commentary. You know, you can rapidly public a, a, um, a post a comment uh, online and people actually do read those. So have a couple of catchphrases that you use that you just copy and paste and plug into any article you see on animal testing. Catchphrases like, we need to move away from animal testing because it's not very reliable for human health. Animal testing is cruel and ineffective. We need to move away from animal testing, things like that. Just have them and please post these comments. The more and more you post these comments, the more places like media outsources like New York Times will actually start to think that they have to be more at least, at the very least, more neutral in their approach and how they discuss animal testing. And maybe they'll actually allow for alternative and differing opinions in, in their news outlets. Thanks. Elizabeth? Being the, the lawyer on the panel, I am gonna focus on the need for more lawyers in this space. Uh, more and more, I hear that animal studies continue for legal requirements, for legal liabilities, not because they are the best science. So we need lawyers working to restrict animal testing while supporting science that doesn't use animals. Um, I do have a theory that lawyers might perceive a lack of a scientific background as a barrier to entering the field. And I understand it because I once felt that way, but I am here to say that I don't think that barrier is nearly as high as it may be perceived. You don't have to know all of the science. You will be surprised how much you come to know of the science, but you are working closely with scientists every day. You're relying on them for the scientific analysis. And as a lawyer, you are bringing a different set of skills to the table 
that are different and that wouldn't be there, quite frankly, if you weren't involved. Before I wrap it up, I I want to just highlight that there have been advances in the law recently that are really exciting and worth celebrating and bringing it back to the theme of this session. I think they indicate that we certainly are at at least at a turning point. And these advances are the result of lawyers, policymakers, and scientists working together. And I don't, I am naturally optimistic. I don't think I'm deluding myself when I say that I believe we are well on the way. And this is why in 2015, FDA had issued that guidance document explicitly saying that they didn't want, um, that they didn't want live rabbits used for that type of testing anymore. And then companies started using the ex vivo or in vitro approaches. In 2016, the Frank R. Lautenberg Chemical Safety for the 21st Century Act was signed. This was a result of years of lobbying by animal protection groups. And as, as a result of our involvement, it marked the first federal law that compelled an agency to both use and fund the development of non-animal approaches. After that law was passed, I, I have been so impressed. There's been huge strides in um, use of non-animal approaches at the Environmental Protection Agency. And this has led to a work plan for integrating non-animal methods at EPA, internal teams where, where staff are, are directed to work on this, training. Um, we actually partner with the EPA to train their scientists in non-animal approaches. EPA then started funding extramural research as well. And the big thing that came from, from EPA, even big, well, the legislation was amazing, equally amazing, um, was ex-administrator Wheeler's memo that was released stating that um, the EPA now has a goal of replacing mammalian animal testing by 2035. And once that bold goal was set, we saw a major redirection of resources at the agency and also an increase in industry activities. In 2018, California passed the Cruelty-Free Cosmetic Act. This is a law that banned the sale of cosmetics within the state if they were tested on animals after January 1st, 2020. This was the first of its kind legislation in the United States, but after that, many other states have passed similar laws. Last year, Congress passed legislation that directed the agency to update the regulations um, to clearly allow for use of non-animal methods. Last year, FDA, FDA developed a pilot program. That was last year, and it provides a pathway for non-animal methods to be evaluated and accepted by the agency. There's a lot of work to do there still, but the framework is now existing. Um, this year, the FDA issued a report on advancing alternative methods, where now ex-Commissioner Hahn, um, re he states the agency's goal of reducing and replacing animal studies. The FDA didn't used to say things like that. Um, and then recently, a number of laws have been proposed by, or have been introduced by our federal Congress. So all of that to say, lawyers are making a difference. I think there are great laws we can build upon in this sector. We are, as I would say, in the midst of a paradigm change um, with use of animals in science. Yes, we're probably further along for regulatory testing than we are for basic research, but that is changing too. And I do believe lawyers will play a key role when laws change, when policies change, the science changes too. Sue. Elizabeth and Aisha, you put it very nicely. I, I, I usually just tell folks, again, if you're just a regular person, uh, think of yourself in your different roles. So you are a consumer, and I know a lot of people don't like to think of themselves like that, but that's your economic hat, and you do have influence that way. Uh, we've seen the tremendous influence that consumers have had on the cosmetics industry. Uh, and, and I think keep that up. Uh, that's been really important and a real driver. 
uh, companies care about what their customers think. And then you are a citizen. And so it's very important to pay attention to the ways that your uh, members of Congress uh, are, are processing this, all this information, get to know them, uh, engage with them, uh, let them know what your standards are. Uh, it's easy to pass legislation that doesn't really mean a lot, but it's really important to pass legislation that's significant. Uh, it's, it's challenging uh, to work on legislative issues, but uh, it's definitely worth it. And be participate in some of the animal organizations that will let you know uh, when the time is right, you know, to weigh in on stuff. And, uh, and I, I think we all can make a difference. The other thing is that, you know, those are the, maybe the hats you wear, but there's a couple different levels. There's a local level you know, don't uh, underestimate the influence that you have in your community. Uh, I talked about schools, uh, universities, um, if there's uh, animal research going on or animal demonstrations, even dissection at your local school district, pay attention to those things and use your influence there. Uh, sometimes on a local level you can uh, have a little bit more outsized influence than you can uh, otherwise. But certainly, again, on a national, uh, even an international level, uh, your voice makes a difference. So use it. That is all really great advice. Thank you to all of you for sharing that with us. And thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you also to the viewers uh, for joining us. And I do hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.